Hello, good morning ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lutfi and here is my partner Alana. It's precious chance for us to be your master of ceremony on this very special occasion. ICOSTOM 2002 International Sustainability in Technological Environmental Law Management Social and Economic Matters. First of all, let's say thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us guidance, happiness, health, and mercy so that we can attend and participate in this special event without any obstacle. Praise and salutation to our Prophet Muhammad who had brought us to the path of light from the darkness in this life today. And I would like to welcome to all of the speakers and all of the audience today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin this event by reciting Basmala. Bismillah. So let's move on to the next agenda is presenting session by Mr. Salmi Bawasa. Uh, and the time is yours. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Assalamualaikum, and good afternoon to all distinguished guests, panelists, and speakers. My name is Salmi, and I will be representing our preliminary study with my co-author, Dr. Abdul Qadir and Dr. Zainura. The title of the study is Islamic Human Resource Management Practices in Multinational Cooperations, Identification of Turnover Intention. Why Employee Turnover? This is due to the awareness by most organizations that the increasing trends of employee quitting has been worrying. It is worth to be studied as it aids organization's strategic objectives and plans. Employee turnover intention impacts hiring costs, time-consuming, training needs, productivity, drop in morale, and supply. For your information, this study is based on 30 respondents. Employee turnover intention is triggered when the decision to quit rises. Such behavior impacts the organization in multiple ways. Studies have shown that behavior could predict actual turnover. CHRM or Conventional Human Resource Management is very material-based practice. It is equal in many manners but is very money or rewards oriented. IHRM or Islamic Human Resource Management, on the other hand, is virtuous, immersed with Islamic principles from the Quran and the Hadith. Compensation benefits from the CHRM practice impacts job satisfaction and reduce employee turnover intention in the USA. IHRM reduced employee turnover intention in many studies conducted in Malaysia and Indonesia. IHRM were also seen or observed to be beneficial to non-Muslims as well. In the USA, it was found supports from the co-worker and supervisor assist to decrease in the intention to quit. In Pakistan, it was discovered lack of support from the co-worker and supervisor has inverse relationships on knowledge sharing but a positive and significant relationship with the Islamic work ethics and learning objectives. Our objective is to identify the influence that IHRM could potentially have on employee turnover intention in the MNC and also to gauge the mediating effect of the co-worker and supervisor's support. As we all know, employees leave for many reasons. When the commitment decreases, the behavior will transform into the act of resignation. Most of the time, it is a combination of two, that is money and personal. It could be due to the extrinsic reasons or money oriented, intrinsic reason or spiritual or personal mostly, competitive package to be at a certain status level within their social cycle, personal career targets, non-transparency in communication in the organization, and many more. Some of the theories in the study is based on the gas theory that consists of six dimensions analysis of employee turnover intention. Secondly, the Harvard model on finding the right HR policy to get the right outcomes of the practice. And lastly, the Herzberg 
two factor model which is based on the hygiene and motivation factor on the co-worker and supervisor support shared within this that is our conceptual framework the research methodology is conducted based on the study being rare in the, in the industry and in the academia to test whether IHRM can reduce employee turnover intention to predict whether employees do plan to create. It is a quantitative research with positivist research paradigm and correlational analysis. The instruments are the questionnaires analyzed via SPS 26.0. The significant impact the MNCs contributes to the nation includes tax revenue, promoting the country globally, employability to the people of Malaysia. The respondents in this study came from 11 industries in total. Some of the findings include the highest gender are the males, the lowest generations are the I generations, and the highest are the millennials. The highest education of the respondent in these studies are the degree holders. The Debbie Watson is above 2, which is at 2.397. Assumption is met and independent. Simple correlation R is at 0 0.300, which is high correlation. R square, unfortunately, is not so good at 9% model, which is, can be better with a bigger sample size. Or all IVs or independent variable is between four is between 0.426 to 0.812. The lowest combat alpha is from the co-worker and supervisor support, and the highest is from the composition benefits and rewards management. The reliability analysis shown study metrics were very dependable, indicating that more research is warranted. Most of the relationship between the variables were seen to be significant, strong, and positive. The, if the Islamic training development and the Islamic compensation, compensation benefits were, were found to be significant, moderate and positive relationship with the co-worker and supervisor support. There were no significant relationship found between the IVs, the mediating variables and the dependent variables. In conclusion, we trust the study is a success with a bigger sample size. Sample size. It is also shown that there is a significant impact in the first talent or spectrum within the HRM, which is the recruitment, selection, hiring, and retrenchment exercise. As good talent brings the best to the organization, vice versa. It always works both ways, isn't it? We also believe that IHRM could bring the best of all the four spectrums in the HRM, which is hiring, training and development, performance appraisals and compensation and benefits in mitigating employee turnover intention. With this, I will end my presentation for today. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Goodbye and Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for me, Salmi. And let's move on to the next agenda is presenting session by Mr. Ismail Sualman. And time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to everyone. Uh, I will be presenting the Paper, Visual Emotion Factors Influencing Social Movement Participation in Malaysia. My name is Mohamed Firdaus and this paper is jointly uh, researched together with my colleague, Professor Ismail Sualman. So this research is actually um, using the data that we got from the Bersih Movement, one of the largest um, social uh, political movement in Malaysia, uh, beginning from 2007 until 2018. So, um, as observed and based on past research, in Malaysia, there is a rise of online social movements from the 1998 Reformacy and Hindraf, like Occupy Movement, Bersih 1 and Bersih 5. All of these social movement expands using social media and it is a growing trend. Uh, the problem is uh, there is a rise in visual communication among frequent users of social media. However, there are lack research on how visual in social media can contribute to participation in social movement among the public. And furthermore, if you can observe in Malaysia itself, the success of the anti-government movement uh, utilizing visuals uh, like, for example, the activist Fami Reza and also the cartoonist Zuna, they all receive uh, international attention. But the government effort uh, then was evidential in countering these activities, like for example, using counter-propaganda and so on. 
but it seems that the reach and impact was not as far as recognition and popularity garnered by this anti-government movement. So we are proposing the identification of visual strategies by social movement organisations, social media towards political participation in Malaysia. Okay. So upon you, uh, starting this research, uh, we've uh, referred to past research uh, towards understanding the issues. Um, for example, Collective Action by Alberto Malucci in 1994, uh, visual Framing by Antman, Paul Musaris, up until uh, Rodriguez Dimitrova, Guys and also Bok in 2020. Um, issues of, uh, and also past research in social movement and the media also being referred by us, uh, especially by Matuni and Tune and Robisco. Also, social movement in Malaysia is uh, mainly covered by Wise and Lim in 2016. Um, some of the underpinning or important theory that is being referred to are visual agenda setting and also visual framing. Visual framing. Okay, so visual agenda setting is a newer stream of agenda setting research. Okay, so this uh, some of the studies of visual agenda setting found that um, photographs can influence readers' perceptions of issue importance, and also some of the recent um, study like Fahmi, Cho, Wanta, and Song um, found that. Uh, individuals visual memory and emotion increase concerns over the issue of terrorism after 9-11 okay so uh, for the analysis of this research um, we we've adopted um, four levels of visual framing by Rodrigues and Dimitrova in 2011 but we only used uh, two of the four levels which is denotative and also connotative denotative is the basic who and what in the picture and connotative uh, is the frames or the underlying visual frames of the uh, visuals. Okay. So, uh, to further uh, simplify, uh, the aim of this research is to understand the visual strategies of a social movement organization on social media towards political participation. Uh, the first specific research objective is to identify the visual portrayal of issues on the Bersih official social media account during the Bersih movement in Malaysia and to explore the visual frames and symbols that can be identified on the social uh, media account during the Basia movement in Malaysia. Okay. So the method is qualitative using multi-method. Uh, first is visual framing analysis. Uh, we have identified 3,449 photos from social movement organization, social media timeline photos, which is uh, Facebook, from Basia 1 until Basia 5. Uh, we've applied some filtering rule um, that means uh, we've uh, list down, list down uh, the 3,449 photos from the highest like to the lowest like and only selected the high engagement rate which is uh, the photos or visuals that uh, receives uh, 0 0.5 or above, 0.5% uh, or above uh, high engagement uh, engagement rate, sorry. Um, and then uh, it boils down to 59 specimen or images to be analyzed, okay. And then um, the second level of uh, the second method is uh, in-depth interview. Uh, we've interviewed nine informants that is uh, among politicians, visual experts, academicians, and also and also social media users. Okay, all the thematic analysis is analyzed using Atlasty version eight. Okay, so for the results, uh, you can see um, uh, the visual forms of all the visual. The 59 visuals uh, mainly consist of photos and posters. Uh, 29 or 49.15 percent are mainly photos. 38.98 percent uh, uh, mainly uh, from posters, and others like uh, link, infographic, screenshot, and video screenshot. All right. So for the first uh, research objective, um, from denotative, denotatively, we have found that. Um, dominating frames were based on the theme participants of the social movements. Okay, so based on the 61 subjects, visuals of protesters, crowd, and protest seems to be the most frequent element. With each of these um, coding or uh, or elements uh, appeared at least more than 20 times. Okay, so this is the uh, Facebook uh, uh, official Facebook obviously. So these are example of photos that showed the team participants of the social movement. You can see in sample five and sample six, uh, pictures of um, the crowds in street protests. Okay. So the second most dominant theme uh, under denotative or uh, on the first three objective uh, was uh, detected uh, as important individuals uh, related to the movement. 
photos and depictions of politicians and activists appears at least more than five times. The one that appeared the most was a negative portrayal of Datuk Seri Najib Abdul Razak during that time, while individuals from the opposition like Tun Mahathir was mostly positively portrayed. Okay. Uh, po popular activists like Fami Reza were also positively portrayed in an almost heroic fashion. Okay. Uh, this is our, the example. You can see uh, pictures of uh, Datuk Seri Najib Raza, uh, Fami Reza and also Tun Mahathir. For the second objective, uh, connotative, uh, we find out, based on the in -depth interview, pictures of crowd uh, can provide sense of assurance uh, towards um, the uh, social media users uh, and also uh, spectators. Um, and also it provides bandwagon effects and the cool factor so that these um, uh, users of social media uh, will more drawn into this uh, social movement. Okay? Uh, the portrayal of significant individual or important individuals uh, firstly, images of Datuk Sri Najib Abdul Razak was found to be one that induced anger or incite people's anger. Other pictures like Tun Mahathir and also the activist that is being portrayed almost in a heroic fashion uh, were found to be to provide sense of leadership and also the validation of support towards the movement. Uh, last one, portrayal of injustice um, mainly used to gain sympathy from the social media users or spectators and also feel emotion of these protesters and also getting attention um, towards uh, the social movement. And these kind of pictures, uh, portrayal of injustice, um, are actually the one of uh, pictures that uh, being able for the social movement to gain international recognition. Okay. So as a conclusion, an effective visual portrayal of issues is important in this day and age of social media to invite or persuade audience towards a cause or any ideology. Image has a stronger impact on framing relative to textual because image are less invasive and they need less cognitive load or learned skills. Okay? So basically, visuals are often received as objective truths. That's why visual is more powerful than textual. So this finding provides sound insights on visual framing and how it influences the society. Thus, it can provide the basis for stakeholders who wishes to address their viewers effectively through visuals. All right. Thank you very much. I end this presentation with Assalamualaikum and a good day to everyone. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was a really exciting one. So let's move on to our third presentation of the day, which is by Mr. Ahmed Michael Awad, is it? Yeah. Okay. So the code name is TC004. Time is yours. Assalamu alaikum and good day to everyone. My name is Ahmad Mikhail and my partner is Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Kadir. Today I'll be presenting a concept paper on the effects of false advertising on consumers' online purchase behavior with the meditating effect of electronic word of mouth on consumers in Malaysia. The adoption of online shopping has provided a huge marketplace for retailing in Malaysia. Retailers benefiting from the cost-effective channels to reach the target audience and consumers benefiting from the time-saving discounts and variety of products to choose from. Online shopping has encouraged change in the behavior of consumers' purchase process. The consumer's behavior is a fundamental factor for every business. Even though it is easy to appear online, it is more difficult to convert a consumer. The understanding mechanism of consumers' online shopping and behavior is a priority issue for practitioners competing in a fast-growing virtual marketplace. Online shopping is buying, a product, buying products or services through the internet. And online shopping behavior is a buying behavior when an individual buys, utilizes, or disposes a product or service that fulfills their desired need. An online shopping process consists of five steps. One where an individual identifies their need, followed by searching the web for information and performing a product or service comparison, and finally performs a decision and transaction and receives a post-purchase experience. Advertising is the mean of communication used to encourage an audience to form a purchase decision towards a product or service. Advertising is an important essential component for the growth of the economic process of marketers and businesses. The form of advertising used in false 
misleading or unproven way to attract consumers is considered false advertising. It often occurs when advertisers do not disclose the full truth about a product's quality, specification, composition, manufacture, price, or place of origin. False advertising components, the three means or approaches of false advertising that consumers that shapes a consumer's mind globally are unethical advertising, which is manipulation, social or cultural pressure, and false belief, followed by misleading information, which is insufficient information, false statements, and unproven claims, followed by deception, which consists of price changes, hidden charges, and unfulfilled expectations. The use of online advertising in a very competitive marketplace has become a difficult task, and some organizations have adopted the idea of false advertising as a new marketing strategy. The common drawbacks of false advertising is the fast method of display, making advertising more prone to misleading or deceitful acts, as advertisers control all the features. Advertisers may also manipulate consumers by making them vulnerable and less likely to make rational choices. False advertising commonly focuses on product, price, and promotion. The three stages of advertisements that consist of manipulation, misinformation, and deception. Manipulation is the name or trademark modification used to resemble a famous brand, followed by the implementation of what a person could look like. The illusion created to make a consumer vulnerable and think less rational, or having a famous person use the advertised product. As for inf misinformation, consists of advertising product with misleading and insufficient information, specific claims with, with real numbers but no proven evidence that the product is tested or approved, of a fake discounts on prices of products offered and reduction in prices close to expiry date. As for deception consists of wrong delivered goods or no delivery at all, Items are poorly packaged and may be damaged, difficulty in claiming warranty and applying for refund, and items were different from what was advertised. This research focuses on the unethical, misleading, and deception in advertisements that affect the buying behavior of consumers. The study attempts to discover how false advertising affects consumers' online purchase behavior and how the electronic word of mouth meditates the relationship between them. Significance of solving consumers' online shopping problems creates an awareness among consumers on the issues that occur through false advertisements so that they are more alert and aware when purchasing online. A better understanding of this issue will also provide vendors and online shoppers a solution to the issues that might have been overlooked, and online vendors will also be able to attain a more efficient and effective service. As for my research question, we'll be testing to what degree and what extent and how does unethical, misleading, and deceptive advertisements affect a consumer's online shopping behavior, followed by how does the electronic word of mouth meditates the relationship between false advertising and consumer's online purchase behavior, and how does trust moderate the relationship between electronic word of mouth and online purchase behavior. Wu 2003 stated that the, online sh the shopping behavior of a consumer is impacted by four significant mental factors, which are inspiration, recognition, conviction, and disposition. Hassan et al. 2011 defined false advertising as an activity of lying, deceiving, and giving out false information. And Nimran Shah 2015 said that unethical advertising influences consumers' buying behavior by using socio-demographic and cultural factors. And Hassan et al. said that misleading information is the creation of false claims of a product's services, such as characteristics of data, subtle data truth, and development of suggestions. And she 2014 said that deception and advertising only occurs when marketers introduce expectations are not fulfilled. And the general type of disconfirmation occurs in all, in all kinds of unfulfilled expectations. Atika et al 2016 stated that the electronic word of mouth is positive or negative information towards a brand via the web. And Gambita 1988 said that trust has been recognized as an important element of humans' relation, communication, and marketing transaction. The proposed conceptual model for this research will consist of the three components of false advertising, followed the trust and electronic word of mouth factors as the moderating and meditating variables, and the response will be online purchase behavior. We'll be using the stimulus organism response model by Russell and Merbin, 1977.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, not only does that presentation make me want to go online shopping, but be more careful about it. So next in line is Ms. Noor Rashika Zaki. Um, the time is yours. Who is happened to be online also here? Yeah? Uh, welcome to the Zoom session. Ah, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, can. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Noor Rashika Zaki, uh, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and a very good day to all the participants. My name is Aida Wati Zanan Abidin from the College of Computing, Informatics and Media, University Technology Mar Mara, Shah Alam, Malaysia. I am presenting a research done by Ms. Rashika and myself titled Spatial Analysis, Where Are They Now After Graduation? Graduates employability and unemployment in Malaysia has been one of the main national agendas. As more and more graduates are produced, the percentage of unemployed graduates is also increasing. This phenomena of unemployment among graduates are worrying the Malaysian government. Institutions of higher education produced about 341,311 graduates in 2018 from all the universities, colleges and other institutions in Malaysia. And out of these numbers, 58.6% of them have been employed, 15.7% uh, continue their studies, and the balance 25.7% still unemployed. So by definition, unemployed includes person who are able to work but do not work during a reference period. The negative impact of a high unemployment rate to the country is uh, it shows the failure of the country to produce uh, quality youth in helping to grow the country's economy as well as the development of the country. Uh, in addition, the graduates tend to do crimes as their initiative to survive and graduates' mental health could also be affected in the process of their transmission, the transition from university to the labour market. Okay, unemployment uh, may be caused by two aspects, oversupply of graduates in the job market or graduates are unable to meet the skills needed by the industry. As mentioned before, the number of graduates enrolled in university, private or public institution increases over the years or the graduates compete with each other to secure a job. So based on the report in 2019, uh, 41,161 out of 300 46,686 still unemployed within six months after they finish the study. So graduates uh, should have the employability skills as a key to secure a job and to have a better chance to enter the labor market. And one of the factors that determine the effectiveness of an academic institution is actually through the employability of its graduate. So based on the graduate research study for the year 2018, there are five universities that show the highest em employability. The first one is uh, University of Malaysia Pahang with 96.2%, followed by University of Pertahanan Malaysia, then University of Pertanian Malaysia. Uh, fourth place is University of Technology Mara. And last, the fifth place is uh, University of Malaya with 80.3%. Okay, the graduate tracer study conducted by the Ministry of Higher Education involved identification and follow up of graduates from higher education institution to see how the graduates view the experience through their study and transition to the job market. So the main purpose of this uh, survey is actually to obtain information on the graduate employment status after they finish their study. So graduates are required to fill up the survey form usually given to them uh, during the uh, registration for convocation and they have to fill in. So the implementation of the uh, graduate tracer study helps in producing the information of the graduates for higher education institution, such as the graduate employability, employment status, uh, monthly income, and also the graduate's employer. 
In addition, the survey also emphasized the views and evaluation of the institution, including the effectiveness of the selected programs, facilities, infrastructure, teaching and learning process. Another important variable obtained from the survey is the current residence address or the company where the graduates are working address. This variable would be the best indicator of the dynamic of migratory movement of students. We call this the mobility of the employed graduates. So mobility is crucial and it allows graduates to improve earnings and standard of living if their initial residence could not provide sufficient income or job. For the government or local authorities, this is important to have uh, a strategic national planning, especially for the urban development. For the methodology in this research, okay, the data used in this in this study was a secondary data uh, of UITM tracer study for 13 years from 2006 to 2018. The data was obtained from the Department of Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, UITM Malaysia. There are some steps uh, being performed before proceed with the mapping analysis, for example, to handle with the missing value. So in this study, uh, missing values for numerical variables were replaced with the average of the variable. And for the categorical variable, the missing value were replaced with the model value. So the reason why this imputation is chosen is because uh, these values won't change the original distribution of the variables involved. So in the final data set, after uh, Cater for missing value and after exclude 2018, we exclude the 2000, 2018 data because the number of participants during that year is very small compared to the previous year. So uh, we only left with 53,864 uh, observation out of 55,000 uh, observation in the uh, in the first phase. So the research design used in this study is the exploratory data and data analysis. We use descriptive statistic uh, through graphical presentation such as mapping and also bar chart. And for the advanced statistical analysis, we use the spatial temporal analysis. So uh, this is uh, useful because we can see the map and we can see the distribution uh, across space and time because we want to see uh, want to explore the relocation among the integrates and also want to see the distribution of the unemployment in Malaysia. Okay, the variables used uh, in this study are the follows, the following. Okay, state, we have the state, we have the year, we have the status, we have three status, employed, unemployed or for the study and relocation, whether they, re they relocate from their initial residence or not. Okay, as for the results, Okay, uh, the bar chart uh, shows the number of students who the status of the employment status of the students uh, from 2006 to 2017. So whether they are employed or for the studies or unemployed. So as you can see here, the number of graduates increase each year. The unemployment rate also increase each year. Uh, but uh, the students who when for further study, uh, maintain from 40 percent to 52 uh, percent from 2006 to 2018. Okay, to have a clearer view, uh, according to state, we have the spatial and temporal analysis. Okay, you can see that this one is for 2014. Uh, the map shows by color, so the color, the darker the color means the percentage is higher. Okay, you can see that the highest employment rate is in Selangor, followed by Kuala Lumpur and Johor. While the uh, distribution for the graduate to further their study is actually the same, almost the same for all the state. Okay, and uh, for the unemployment, okay, we can see that the higher percentage is at Kelantan, Sabah, Sarawak, Kedah and also Perak. Okay, in 2014, okay, shows that the graduates most likely to further studies for all state the distribution of employment among graduates increased quite extensively in 2014. Uh, and then the second highest, uh, the, the highest, uh, the state with the highest employment is Kuala Lumpur and the second highest is Selangor, the third is uh, Johor. You can see that there are seven states recorded with unemployment rate higher than 30% uh, at Pahang, Terengganu and also Kelantan, Sarawak also. Okay, in 2015, um, you can see that the higher, the darker color represents the high number of graduates to opt for further study. So high employment rate recorded at seven states, 
Okay. Uh, Johor, Selangor, Kuala Lumpur, Melaka, Pahang, Perak and Pulau Pinang. Uh, state of Selangor, Johor Kuala Lumpur indicates the highest. Okay, furthermore, the level of unemployment has slightly decreased since all states indicate that the percentage of unemployment rate lower than 30%. But Kelantan and Sabah still recorded uh, with high unemployment rate. The bar chart here shows the spatial mobility of graduates uh, throughout 2006 to 2017. Blue represent uh, whether they, uh, they did not relocate. Uh, red means they relocate. Okay. It shows that graduates are less partially mobile over the year. Uh, they tend to stay at their place rather than moving to other place or after finishing study. Okay, mapping for the, the state will be uh, next uh, to show in detail what happened in each state. Okay, here is the distribution by state in 2013. So the, sh the slide shows that uh, in Peninsula Malaysia, they are more partially mobile compared to Sabah and Sarawak. Okay, it indicates that about a state record uh, higher than 50%. Okay, uh, Perlis, Kedah, Perak, Kelantan, Terengganu, Pahang, Bismillah and Melaka. Uh, graduate from Kelantan and Bismillah should most partially mobile. Uh, and then uh, graduate from Sarawak and Sabah are much less uh, mobile. Okay, in 2014, uh, graduate from Kelantan and Bismillah are most partially mobile in getting a job. Okay, conversely, the number of states with the graduate staying in their region slightly increase. Okay, we have Selangor, Kuala Lumpur, Pulau Pinang, Johor, Melaka, Sabah and Sarawak. So, Sarawak indicate the highest percentage. In 2015, for all the states, the mobility of graduates slightly decreased. Okay, uh, and we have the state with the most partially mobile, Kelantan and Perlis. Uh, Negeri Sembilan also shows uh, most graduates tend to move to other states. And for state that uh, not especially mobile is Sabah and Sarawak. Okay, so as a conclusion, so according to all the maps and charts that, sh that have been shown, the distribution of employment among graduate increased over time. Unemployment also showed an increment pattern. Many graduates opt for further study after graduation. They stayed with the high percentage of employed, Selangor, Pulau Pinang, Melaka and Johor. And then uh, stay with high unemployment rate, Sabah, Sarawak, Kelantan, Terengganu and Pahang. So distribution of migration among graduates decrease over time. Okay, graduates from Kelantan, Gismila and Perlis are more spatially mobile. Graduates from Sabah and Sarawak tends to stay in their states, though the unemployment percentage is high for both states. Eh? So states like Selangor, Kuala Lumpur and Johor also show less spatially mobile. However, the employment rate is also high meaning that there are a lot of opportunities for job uh, for the graduates with greater uh, labor market. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I thank you. And this is my reference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next in line, we have an interesting presentation from Ms. Felina Feliz Fuza Hamdan. Uh, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. My name is Felina Feliz Fuza Binti Hamdan. Today I will present my paper with the title of Customer Experience and Continuous Intentions in Malaysia E-Hailing Industry. This is the content I will go through for today, which we will go through the introductions, the literature review, proposed framework, methodology, and lastly, its conclusion. What is e-hailing? E-hailing is a process of ordering a private vehicle to transport a passenger that facilitated by the user of technology and apps according to Jais and Mark Zuki in 2020. Continuous intentions occurs when customer experience the service purchase. Customer will commit to continue using e-hailing service after they have some experience with the services. For example, individuals with a positive experience with e-hailing service are more likely to have a higher continuous intentions than those with a negative experience. The continuous intentions in e-hailing service has received less attention as stated by Abu Semar, Rashid, Ramin and Ahmad in 2019. 
and it is evidenced by the number of consumers choosing a traditional taxi instead of e-hailing, which is, has increased from 20% to 40% by 2022. The figure shows that e-hailing customers tend to switch to other public form stations due to the issues they face with the e-hailing service. According to DeLeon, in 2018, there has been a significant increase in compliance files against e-hailing service due to poor service. Besides, the e-hailing service in Malaysia have been involved in numerous trust breaching problems, including data privacy, face search and safety, such as sexual harassment, misconduct, assault, and accidents, which continue to affect this emerging industry. The purpose of this study is to investigate the customer experience towards continuous intentions in e-hailing service. The relationship of product experience and continuous intentions. According to Spacey in 2017, product, product experience is a component of customer experience that includes all the interactions between the company and the customers. In the context of e-hailing, customers are free to cancel and request a different driver if if they feel like their safety is not assured or uncomfortable. And customers who are more experienced have a higher standard. Hence, as continuous intentions is improved, the standards of customer also will increase. The relationships of outcome focus and continuous intentions. Klaus and Maklan in 2012 highlighted that outcome focused experience refers to a reduction in customer transactions costs, including searching for others and qualifying new service providers. As reported by a previous study, outcome focus has been found to be the significant influence of past experience with the service company in creating continuous intentions. The relationships of moments of truth and continuous intentions. Moments of truth happens when a customer and a service providers connect in a way that may leave a lasting favorable or unfavorable impressions on the customer. During these moments of truth, the customers gain an experience that would affect their future decisions on the service. In terms of e-hailing, the situations the user experienced before booking a car while riding the car and after riding the car plays an essential role in their decisions whether to use the same service again in the future or not, and this can be known as continuous intentions. The relationship of peace of mind and continuous intentions. According to Klaus and Mark Lan, peace of mind is defined as the customer opinion of all contexts with the service mm -hmm. providers before, during, and after the transition has been secured. Hey, customers yeah, feel yeah. more at ease yeah. when they are labeled as value customers rather than a well-behaved customers. This, in fact, allows them to reach peace of mind and thus will affect their intentions to continue with the service from the same company in the future. This is the proposed framework of this study where the framework will focus on the relationship among the four independent levels of customer experience that consists of product experience, outcome focus, moments of truth, and peace of mind towards continuous intentions in using e-hailing service. This, is, this study will apply the survey method whereby the questionnaire will be used as the research instruments collect the required data. In the unit analysis, or the, this study is customer of e-hailing, which is indi individually. The total, the total population of this study is 5.5 million of e-hailing passenger in Malaysia. Referring to ZESCO formula, the data will be dis distributed to 385 passengers as a sample size of this study using purposive sampling technique. Then the collected data will be analyzed using the statistical package for social science as version 26 to test the hypothesis of this study. As a conclusion, the customer experience will lead to improving continuous intentions among Malaysian e hailing users. Future research has started to determine other important variables that may have an impact on continuous intentions specifically in the e hailing industry. This study also suggested the mediated role of trust should be included in this context as it may affect how customer experience and continuous intentions are related.
Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, next, we have, wow, he's already a doctor. Okay, uh, very honored. Uh, next is Dr. Abdul Qadir Ottoman. So he will be presenting to us live. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. The, the floor is yours, doctor. Right, thank you very much. Okay, let me share my slide. Okay, can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Right, thank you very much. All right, uh, sorry for, for taking some time uh, to, to allocate for my, my slot for presentation. Yeah. Actually, I plan to present uh, in room two, but since my, my all my students are here, so I decided to, to present uh, my topic eh, here in room one. Okay, the topic is uh, regarding uh, factors that influence customer satisfaction of fast food restaurant. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I, as we know that uh, uh, there is a shift in customer preference. Yeah? Customer preference now, most of them are uh, looking at something that is easier to get, fast to be yeah, to be consumed and so on. Yeah? Customer satisfaction, let's say, uh, when we want to uh, look into the customer satisfaction, the feelings of customers pertaining to the consumption of a certain product or service, yeah? in this case, fast food, yeah? uh, we look at the the emotional outcome after they have consumed the service or the product. And of course, when we talk about customer satisfaction, the theory, the most popular theory is confirmation disconfirmation theory yeah? uh, by Parasaraman and uh, his colleagues. Yeah? In Malaysia, fast food industry has grown exponentially since its inception in 1963 uh, with the opening of the first PNW outlet in Kuala Lumpur. And after that, we can see the mushrooming of uh, fast food restaurants in uh, Malaysia. Nah? Uh, some fast food restaurants uh, are doing very well. They can attract a lot of uh, customers, but others are facing problems attracting uh, customers to their customers. This is the issue that we want to investigate. Look at the question of why some, uh, some fast food restaurants are, are good, eh? but the others fail to attract customers. Uh, to, to to their premises. So the producer says to investigate the factors that influence customer satisfaction in choosing fast food restaurants in Malaysia. Uh, the identification of factors actually based on previous studies yeah, uh, that have uh, conduct that have been conducted to to identify uh, factors that contribute to customer choice. And these factors include service quality, price, physical environment, waiting time, and also food quality. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move to the methodology section. Namaste. This research is uh, using correlational research design because we want to test the hypothesis. Uh, we have actually developed a few hypotheses to yeah, uh, with regard to all the identified factors that link to the customer customer satisfaction of using fast of uh, patronizing fast food restaurants, and with regard to population, customers from popular fast food restaurants including Burger King, Domino's, Pizza, KFC, Mary Brown, McDonald's, and Pizza Hut will be uh, included. Eh? Uh, will be actually involved in this survey. Uh, from the population, we managed to get 120 respondents by using online uh, survey. The instrument, actually, we, ad adopt, we adopted and adapted uh, the, the first research instrument uh, so that we can, yeah, actually, this is uh, this, uh, uh, the students' work. Uh, they just want to confirm or uh, disconfirm the hypothesis that we developed and a lot of actually past research have been done and there are a lot of uh, established instruments to measure all the variables involved in the study. So we just adopt and adapt whatever we found to form uh, the instrument for our study. We use online platform, Google, uh, Google Form eh, to collect the data. 
And for data analysis, we use descriptive and also inferential statistics. Okay, let's look at the findings of this. The first slide uh, is regarding the uh, respondents' profile. Uh, there are six, uh, six restaurants, types of restaurants participated in this in study, although the number is quite uh, dissimilar. Eh? You can see uh, from for Burger King, only one respondent, also Mary Brown, one respondent. But uh, highest respondent, the number of highest number of respondents of customers for McDonald's, eh? customers of McDonald's. As regards to gender, we can see female. Female respondents prefer to have uh, mm, fast food, eh, actually, as compared to male respondents. Age, the younger generation, 19 to 38 uh, years old participants uh, prefer to, uh, to, to eat fast food. Eh, eat fast food. Uh, with regards to employment st status, most of them students, uh, as it is actually uh, related well with the age, eh? 19 to 28 years old. And regarding the income, most of them have no income because they are still student, eh? students. Okay, looking at the uh, second slide of the findings, eh? uh, these are the items that we use to collect the data uh, with regard to all the factors like independent variables and also dependent variables. Uh, the results of factor analysis uh, display uh, clean factor structure. A clean factor structure. Five items measure service quality for a group uh, to measure service quality. Uh, uh, for price, we have four items. For physical environment, we have also four items. Eating time, we have three items. Food quality, we have three items. Uh, this, this indicates that the instrument that we use are valid to measure the intended item, intended variables. And for dependent variable, customer satisfaction, we use uh, five items to measure the variable. Yeah? It also form a unidimensional construct. Yeah? Okay, then we move to correlation analysis. All factors are correlated very well, uh, indicating uh, for independent variable. Yeah? Uh, indicating uh, we call convergent validity and between IV and DV you can see it shows a concurrent concurrent validity of the of the variables yeah? uh, for reliability analysis uh, for reliability analysis the numbers in brackets yeah? uh, service quality the reliability for service quality promo alpha for service quality 0.868 Price 0.875 for physical environment 0.804 for waiting time 0.773 for food quality 0.717 and customer satisfaction 0.903 indicating that the items are reliable right, to measure the intended construct or the intended variables. Okay, then we, we move to a multiple regression analysis to confirm, yeah, to confirm the findings from correlation analysis and from Five factors, service quality, price, uh, physical environment, waiting time, food quality, we found that only three. Three factors are uh, actually significant to influence customer satisfaction using or buying fast food, consuming fast food. The first one, the highest beta, uh, standardized beta, is waiting time, 0.317, followed by service quality and the last one, price. Two factors are not significant physical environment and food quality. So from here we can uh, confirm eh, the most of the studies on uh, fast food restaurant, uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, the three factors actually uh, important or significant in influencing their uh, decision, their, their emotional emotional feelings with pertaining to consuming uh, fast food. So when uh, we talk about the application of the study in the case of fast food restaurant, uh, because waiting time is a, a significant factor, so the queue system, the, the queuing system must be in place. We don't want customers to wait longer to get their, their food, eh, their order. Using a customer kiosk, uh, one of the options, customers can get the orders, uh, their meals, wait at the chosen table before the fulfillment of the orders. Uh, so far, it is the best option available for customers. Yeah, they don't have to stand 
uh, in the queue waiting for the numbers to be called call out. Yeah. Uh, second factor <coughs> with regard to service quality. That's why here we can see that uh, customer facing employees need to be courteous, sincere, and professional in delivering the service in interacting with the customers. Yeah. Uh, they have to uh, have high levels of emotional stability to successfully deal with uh, varying types of customers, including demanding customers. We don't know. They come to get the service from us, whether they are happy at the time or not. Yeah? That's why we need to be uh, to have emotional stability. Yeah? Second, uh, third, sorry, third is to get the price. The customers will be satisfied. The price of the food they have to pay is reasonable. Reasonable because uh, the value and the value uh, from the purchase is actually based on uh, the perception of the customers. Why, when we talk about the value or the price or the product or the, or the service, yeah, uh, we always need to put ourselves on the perspective of, perspective of customers. Yeah, because different customers are different demands, different requirements, different expectation and so on uh, okay then uh, fast food restaurant must emphasize on value the value of the food so that the customers might enjoy when buying it for conclusion yeah, fast food has become the first choice among the new generation and defeating traditionally prepared food because of the changing lifestyle not only in Malaysia but also in Indonesia yeah, brought by modernization Customers nowadays spend less time preparing food and are looking more time to earning a living because now we can see that a lot of parents, uh, husband and wife, working to, uh, to earn a living. Uh, okay, they, have, they don't have much time to prepare uh, food, uh, traditional food at home. And this study revealed that uh, service quality, price, waiting time are uh, significant, significant predictors of customer satisfaction when patronizing fast food restaurants. A future research is recommended to replicate instead to confirm the current findings. Because, yeah, of course, uh, maybe a different different country, different context of the study might have different, you know, might, might provide some input pertaining to uh, the influence of the determinants of customer, you know, the determinants and also customer, the outcome of customer satisfaction of patronizing fast food restaurants. And the next one is comparative study. Uh, comparative study is also encouraged because um, maybe eh, there will be different, different expectation and perception of customers pertaining to the elements that contribute to their satisfaction uh, between fast food and non-fast food restaurants. And it's good to, to see eh, whether eating time, service quality, food qualities, and other factors will have a different, different effect on customer satisfaction when looking at uh, different types of restaurant. All right, thank you very much. And before I end, I would like to uh, promote eh, actually a uh, conference in Coma, International Conference on Marketing and Retailing, which will be held uh, on uh, next year, eh, next year, on the 1st and 2nd of March 2023 in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, prominent hotel Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. Uh, the website now is uh, open and submit the website until 25th of November. After that, uh, we will open the system for the full people until 6th of January. The payment later on. Eh? And pre recorded video and also online presentation are also encouraged eh, for all the participants. Please participate in our conference. Please join our conference, inshallah. Thank you very much. Abdul Kadir Otman for the meaningful presentation. Thank you. And the next agenda is presenting session by Mr. Zainuddin bin Zakaria. The time is yours. Thank you.